As we head into this Easter season, as uh, is kind of mentioned, today is Palm Sunday. And uh, when we look at uh, the narrative, which is actually called the Passion Narrative, uh, leading to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection on the cross, like the Sunday leading up to Resurrection Sunday is Palm Sunday. And it's called Palm Sunday because uh, the crowds and, and everyone in Jerusalem heard that there was a king coming into town, which was Jesus. And so they had, the, they had all these expectations of liberation. They bring these, uh, you know, palm branches as to like usher in a new king in town. And right now, you know, we're in this very kind of brief teaching series called Cruciform Realities. And this is our second week. And the heart of it as we lead into Sunday is to be reminded of what it truly means to be followers of Jesus. And so we've titled it very intentionally, Cruciform Realities. And the word cruciform is not a regular word that we really use, uh, especially even in Christian circles. The word cruciform, by definition, is to be cross-shaped. On a deeper and more theological level, and when I say theological, theology is just the study of God. So in a spiritual level, it means to embody the gospel, embody Jesus, very WWJD vibes is cruciform or cruciformity. And I think, you know, as we think about our cultural moment, our current context, and as followers of Jesus in the West, and when I say West, it's our affluent and very privileged culture, um, it seems that we have strayed away from the actual realities of Jesus' gospel. And so last week, we talked about the way of discipleship, and we looked at Mark 8, um, 30, uh, sorry, 27 to 38, where Jesus himself defines what discipleship is. Um, discipleship, is we, some, in some church circles, we use the word apprenticeship. A disciple is to be a student. So as disciples of Jesus, we are students of Jesus, our teacher, our Lord, and our Savior. Um, but a lot of the disciples, even Peter himself as one of the main disciples, had these mis- conceived ideas of who Jesus, what the way of Jesus, what he was actually all about. There's this, pre -con there's this uh, misconception that following Jesus means ruling as saints in the kingdom of God, where in reality, it actually means to live as servants for the kingdom of God. The path that Jesus presents and invites us to is not a path of self-fulfillment, it is a path of self-denial. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's what we talked about last week. And today we're gonna talk about the way of suffering. The way of suffering. And I do wanna be clear before we kind of move forward that there is a very big difference between suffering and grief. They are not the same thing. Just to be clear, because it's very important to understand. Um, there's not enough time to talk about grief this morning, but I would say if um, you would want resources or maybe just a more clear understanding. Um, there's this book that's really helpful uh, that I read. I took a, a pastoral specific like grief course at, at Regent. Um, and we do have a photo. If not, you can Google Dr. Ross Hastings on Amazon. Uh, it's got this red cover of, of, is it there? Oh yeah, my man, Dr. Ross. Um, I was in his class. And so he uh, shouted out his own book, which I thought, okay. But it was actually quite, quite good. Um, and so don't let the cover art deceive you. That was a, this is a very good book. Um, it gives a really good theology around grief, but we're not talking about that this morning. We're talking about suffering, what it means to suffer. Um, so as Google defines uh, suffering, it is to experience or be subjected to something bad or unpleasant. Seems like a bit of a soft definition. Um, a more scriptural definition that I think would be helpful for us this morning um, is enduring distress pain and or death. And I think in our Western understanding, in our Western practice of the way of Jesus, this aspect of suffering has kind of wandered off from what it means to follow Jesus. And like I mentioned, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Jesus, all those titles right now, Jesus, the Son of God, he is Lord, Savior, all the things. Um, but again, he gives us this definition of what discipleship is. But it's specifically in verse 34, like he explicitly says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. 
And so again, Jesus is literally saying, when he says to us, pick up your cross and follow me, he's, he's kind of saying a very big thing, like take up the death penalty and follow me. And again, in the first century context, context is everything when we read the Bible. And within the Roman Empire, execution by crucifixion was uh, the most, um, the, the, the apex of how you could execute someone. Um, it was the most inhuma in, inhumane way to kill someone because by crucifixion, um, you don't die because of blood loss. You die because of eventual suffocation amidst all of the pain. And so when Jesus is saying, pick up your cross and follow me, these aren't, this is not light. He is giving incredible tension for those that are, are wrestling with, is, is Jesus really truly God? Is this the life that I want? But again, in the suffering, there is supernatural joy. And so this aspect of suffering is so key in our discipleship, in our apprenticeship, in our apprenticeship to Jesus. And as the global church, as we enter into Holy Week this week, and, and, and as we sit in the tension of Good Friday, as we patiently wait for Resurrection Sunday, it's so important we understand as followers of Jesus here and now in 2023 in the West, what it means to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. And so in our teaching text today, as Ben so kindly read, um, it kind of highlights this person named Stephen. And Stephen is one of the deacons in the early church. Deacons is just another word for like one of kind of the key leaders that helped to pastor, shepherd, and lead uh, the church. And so before we actually look at the life and ministry of Stephen specific to this teaching text, I think it's actually helpful to look at some of the preceding chapters that lead to this moment where Stephen is actually stoned. And so again, it's from the book of Acts. And Acts is just short form for Acts of the Apostles. Um, uh, disciples is just another word for student. Apostles, another word for teacher. Students turned apostles, students turned to teachers for clarity. Anyways, uh, so a couple chapters prior in chapter five, we see the apostles who are the disciples, they're sent, apostles is sent. And they're like sharing the gospel, they're healing people. Um, in Acts five, we actually see even very incredible moment where um, because God's spirit is on the apostles, Peter, as he's walking through the streets, it must have been a sunny day because people were so desperate to even like kind of get their like, you know, if, if they were sick to even just get um, their hand on Peter's shadow because God's presence was so heavy and present on Peter and the, dis and the, the apostles that people were getting healed. Like it's crazy some of the miracles and things and functions that are going on in chapter five. And as all of these really cool things of healing and miracles and the kingdom being expanded and being established here, uh, the Jewish authorities, the same Jewish authorities that were responsible for condemning and killing and executing Jesus are really upset. And they're like, I, they thought that they got rid of Jesus, but here they're, they're continuing to hear word about Jesus. And so they're like, we, gotta, we have to throw these guys in jail. Because um, people are, are changing, they're, they're, they're following Jesus, like what's going on? I thought we killed him. And so there, there's a lot of unrest among the Jewish authorities. And so they, they attempt to throw the apostles into jail. And so later on in chapter five, the apostles are, are in prison, but an angel of the Lord comes in and frees them and tells them, hey, go do exactly what you were doing. What you got in trouble for, yeah, go back and do that. Continue to spread the good news of the gospel. So the apostles, they leave jail and they go straight back into the temple courts to share the good news of Jesus. And so then we see that the Jewish authorities are like, why are they back? Um, you know, like I thought we put them in jail. Why would they go back to the scene of the crime? Like what is going on? But there's like, there's something about these apostles. There's like this tenacity and grit in their faith now. Um, a, a few weeks ago, um, you know, we looked at a, a moment with the disciples and Peter where um, they, were, they were getting rebuked because of their misunderstanding. But we see now post-resurrection, and we'll get into it a little bit more next week on Easter Sunday, but something has clearly changed where they are not afraid. They're willing to take risks. They're, they're, they're willing to put their lives on the line any opportunity and, and every opportunity, they're taking it to share the good news of Jesus. When I was a kid, um, like I've grown up in East Van my whole life. And uh, every time we would get uh, groceries, we would go to the superstore on Grandview. 
It's right by the Rupert Sky Train. And uh, I'm an only child. And uh, every time, you know, where we get the cart and you gotta put the loony in and you get the things, and you know, as a kid, like kid, and I'm not in my adolescence, I'm a kid, just so you know. Um, you know, you put all the things on the cart and you press the button and it moves, you know, everything to the cashier. And if all the conditions were right, I would always try to slip in like a candy or like, cause all the chocolates are there. So whether it's like Kinder Surprise, I actually really like the arrow. I don't know if that's still a thing, like the mint specifically. Um, so I'd kind of wait until, you know, the cashier's like, boop, boop, and I'd try to just toss it in. Um, and then my mom would catch me sometimes and then I'd get scolded. But every time I was back, I would just see, is my mother or my dad looking at the cashier? Are they talking? Can I just throw it in? Uh, I'd usually get in trouble when I get home. But being an only child, that only lasts for so long. So <laughs> thanks, mom, for all the chocolate, um, whether it was intentional or not. But we see these apostles, they go back. To the, to the scene of the crime, right? Where they got in trouble, where they were thrown in jail. But they still go after it. They're still about sharing the good news of Jesus. And so we see that uh, later on in the chapter, there's some political conversations happening now among the Jewish authorities. And they're actually wrestling with like, I don't, they're, they're not sure if they can stop these guys because they were actually fearing other people. Because they're like, if we put these guys back into jail, they might, the people might just riot against them. So they decide not to put them back into the jail. Um, and, but they do address the apostles. They do have a conversation with them. And they say explicitly in Acts 5.40, uh, do not speak and preach the name of Jesus. We'll let you go free, but we do not want to hear the name Jesus from your lips. Um, so what do the apostles do upon their release? Acts 5.41-42, to 42, the apostles left the council and were happy because God had considered them worthy to suffer for the sake of Jesus. Every day they spent time in the temple and in, in one home after another, they never stopped teaching and telling the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And so they kindly say to the Jewish authorities, thanks, but no thanks. We're gonna continue to talk about Jesus. And so as chapter five comes to a close, we kind of see, um, again, there's like a lot of craziness that's happened. And so, how does chapter six begin? It begins with this, Acts six, verse one. A lot of people were now becoming followers of the Lord. When we zoom out and look at chapter five at a macro level, we can see that the apostles' persecution and suffering is a catalyst for the gospel to spread. It's almost like a math equation. Like suffering is part of God moving. I did terrible at math, but it's like those like built-in equations, like they just work. Like y equals mx, mx plus b, that's what it is. Um, it's like a math equation. And so, you know, chapter five goes along and then at the beginning of Acts six, um, and again, what Ben read was kind of the tail end of Acts six, but at the beginning of Acts six is where Stephen is actually first introduced. So allow me to read this for us. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. Stephen, parentheses, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, close parentheses. Philip, Prochorus, Nick, Nick, I was just trying to pronounce this beforehand. Nicanor, <laughs> Nicanor. Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas. Yeah, Parmenas, Nicholas, very, that's what it was. I, was, I listened to YouTube to make sure I was saying them right, but that failed me anyways. Um, uh, Nicholas of Antioch, an early con convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Shout out to laying hands in prayer. Verse seven, so God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. And so we see here that the apostles are investing and raising and discipling other people to help share in the responsibility and stewardship of being the church. 
Um, and so again, we're seeing disciples, as I mentioned, disciples, another word for students. We're seeing students turn into teachers. We're seeing disciples turn into apostles. And Stephen is one of these new apostles that's being ordained and commissioned and spurred forward. And so the first person, again, that we see is Stephen, and he gets his own special parentheses, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And so for us in this room, for really us as the church, as sons and daughters of the living God, is this not the parentheses we want attached to our name? Being people that are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And so we see in this commissioning of these seven that the, and this is in verse four, or verse seven, the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And so as we move into verse eight, the narrative begins to highlight Stephen's ministry. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, and Cilicia and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, this man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. And so we see Stephen in his ministry and his obedience in his faith. He meets resistance from the Jewish authorities, this high council, the same high council, high council that was responsible for the execution of Jesus. And so Stephen, in this moment, what I just read is pretty much on trial. And he is being set up, right? False witnesses, the whole thing. And so we see that the Jewish leaders are getting false witnesses to testify. And these Jewish prosecutors are distorting information to create this false narrative. And so we see Stephen here um, just kind of in it. But all of a sudden, we see this glow kind of happen on, on Stephen, a glow and his appearance is shining, uh, almost kind of like resembling an angel. And so if you recall, um, we can even look at Moses and uh, in Exodus 34, 29 to 30, when Moses is in the presence of God, he begins to glow. Um, we can look at the life of Jesus um, when he brings uh, Peter, James, and John up with him and we see that transfiguration narrative and all of a sudden there's this crazy glow. We can associate this glow with the presence of God. In both of these examples, like there's a mountain involved. There's no mountain here where Stephen is. He's on trial, yet he's got this glow. And remember, Stephen is described as a person full of faith and full of the Spirit. This glow is simply a manifestation of God's presence and his power. And so let's shelf this thought, this idea of glow and God's presence. We'll just put it on the shelf for now and we will come back to it in just a few minutes. So as we turn finally into Acts 7, um, Stephen pretty much like lays down this like really big call out. And he's calling out the religious elite, the Jewish authorities, for actually not being shepherd of not being shepherds of God's people, but being persecutors of God's people. Um, and so he kind of again he gives a very strong call out, but honestly, it was it was with loving intentions. Like they needed a rebuke. When was the last time that you at least maybe attempted or tried to give a loving call out to someone? A few, several actually, I gotta say several now. This is several years ago. I was um, meeting with a pastor, a youth pastor, and they were kind of talking to me about their season and what was going on and how they were feeling and their rhythms. And like in my mind, I'm like, man, like you're burnt out. And again, as I say this several years ago, I feel like the word burnt out today is a bit too wide of a meaning. It's like maybe you get six hours of sleep and you're like, oh, I'm burnt out. It's like, ah, you know, you just need two more hours. You feel pretty good right now. 
But this person very much in terms of the rhythm, the output, the weariness and fatigue, emotional stress, everything that was going on from what they were telling me, I'm like, man, this person is burnt out. They are barely hanging on. They need a break. They need some type of intervention. They need to step back. And so as I'm kind of listening to this person share, um, and you asked, as they finished sharing with me, I kindly said, I'm like, hey, like, I think you're burnt out. And uh, I kind of like felt a bit of a stiffening, um, a vibe, hard vibe change clearly in this moment. But I just kind of kept talking and tried to be, you know, pastoral and, you know, this, this, blah. Anyways, a few days, I kind of, again, kind of heard what this person was feeling after I had this, I don't even think it was a, a call out to be honest. I was just like, hey, you're burnt out. Um, for them, they actually associate the word burnt out with like moral failure. That's how they understood the word. And so they were livid, dude. They're telling all the people, who is this Jer guy, dude? This guy's whack. Like the audacity, this guy's saying that I'm burnt out, you're burnt out. So I'm hearing all of this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that is not how I expected you to react. Uh, and all I said was like, hey, I, I, I'm encouraging you. You just need to change your rhythms. There needs to be a shift in pace. You're doing way too much. But yeah, this person was so mad at me. Um, but it was funny because I, I mentioned that and then some people that were closer to this person encouraged this person to actually get counseling. Um, and it wasn't until months later that I heard back from this person who messaged me and apologized because the counselor said very similar sentiments to what I said. Um, and again, sometimes it's hard when we think about you know, close and accountable relationships, but we need call outs all the time. It's only the people that like love you that are willing to like go through tension like that. Um, we need call outs, they're good. And, and we need to invest in relationship and it takes time for relationships to grow in Christ. This is a tangent, it's not even part of the sermon right now. But anyway, Stephen gives this huge call out to these religious leaders. And again, this is very, very dangerous because these are the same people, the high council that are responsible for Jesus' execution. So by way of Stephen saying, hey, you guys are actually are persecuting God's people. Like, I'm sure Stephen in his mind probably understood there's a very real chance that I could be executed. So now this finally brings us to the teaching text in which Ben read, which was the stoning of Stephen. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusations and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. In other translations, it says Saul approved of Stephen's killing. Verse 59, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Again, Stephen is constantly throughout all of all of the texts that I have read, he's constantly referred to someone as being filled and full of the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes when we pray something, maybe along these lines, God, would you give me strength? Would you fill me with your presence? Fill me with your spirit. And all of a sudden we experience suffering and hardship and adversity in our life. All of a sudden we're like, we blame God. Why would you put me in such a difficult season? I thought you loved me. Last Friday, I, uh, he's gonna be here actually in two weeks. He's one of my really dear friends. He, he's been really contending and praying for a community, but his name's uh, Catlin. He's a, pa a lead pastor out in Langley. And uh, recently I started like working out with him. Again, no cardio, just he's a bodybuilder. So we, we, we vibe that way. And we train together. And uh, it's funny because he's, you'll see him in two weeks. He's way bigger than me. And, you know, we're loading up the weights and like he'll put, and it's like, if you don't know too much about working out, it's like, you got you need some warm up sets, like, you know, bent over rows, you know, working the lats. But you got to warm up before you get to those working sets. And so he loads up the bar. He's like, hey, you're good to start with this. I'm like, this is like my last set that I would do. So I'm like, in my pride, I'm like, oh yeah, no problem, bro. And so like, I start, and then he's like, you know, we do the warm up. He says, okay, I'm going to load another plate. 
I was like, I have to stick. I have to stick with this dude. Like, I, I was, I was capping. Dude, like, I can't actually. I'm not that strong. Um, but he texted me yesterday. He's like, Hey, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm so sore, dude. Usually when I work out on my own, I'm not this sore because I don't actually train as hard as he does. Um, but that's part of growth, right? At least in a bodybuilding perspective, in a lot of areas and a lot of things, like we actually need suffering because it actually produces a better fruit. Like when you think of like farmers and all that they have to do to produce a crop, there's so much labor and time and effort. It takes so long, but the fruit and the care that's actually, pr- that comes out of like laboring and toiling is actually really awesome. Was it not Jesus himself who said in Matthew 16, 25, for for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will find me. Following Jesus is hard. And that's why for us in our community, that's why we really emphasize that following Jesus is a relational practice. When we look at the spirit, all the spiritual disciplines, like by themselves, they're fine. But when done in relationship with one another, there's something special in that. Community isn't just for fun. Community is a practice. Uh, When you are committed to people for the long term, that's hard. You could probably ask any married person in this room, like marriage is hard because it takes work. I can't speak out of experience, but I've hung up with a lot of married people. That's what I hear. The prophet Isaiah talks about the coming Messiah and he refers to him as the suffering servant. Suffering has been part of following Jesus before Jesus' ministry even started. For us, and I I often say Western practice of Christianity for us in Canada, um, we're very privileged, right? Um, But, you know, we don't live in a country or culture where we could actually physically lose our lives for following Jesus. Obviously, there's different means and, and other things where we experience persecution, but we live in a, in a society where we don't actually like be killed or executed. Um, but there are places today in 2023 where people will actually lose their life for following Jesus. When we actually look at the data, because we had a, a class kind of talking about world Christianity, The places where Christianity is growing and spreading are in some of the highest places of real persecution. Uh, Even in China, you can't even have a church like legally there, but the church is growing, which is crazy. Uh, The church uh, throughout Africa is growing. We just had a a class looking at like theologians in Ghana. Shout out to Ato, because I know you're from Ghana, bro. Um, But we're looking at like the church grow and spread like where there's real persecution. Like that math equation, like there's, there's, there's something real that God does. But for, for a lot of these people, their faith in Jesus is everything. Like there's no nominal Christians out there when they're following Jesus. Like it's life or death, but we don't look at our faith like that in our Western practice of following Jesus. And so if we, like, like earlier this year, like when we pray for revival, we're actually, we need to pray for renewal of our hearts that we would begin to actually truly understand what it means to follow Jesus. Because if we're praying, God, would you fill our church with your spirit? Would you fill us with the fullness of Christ? We're praying for a life like Stephen, a life in which his suffering brought God glory. And obviously like, you know, his life ends up in martyrdom. Martyrdom is losing your life for the gospel. And we see incredible peace around him in his last moments like in, in, on earth, obviously. And as we talk about next week, the resurrection, we know that death no longer has a final word. But what are the two things that result in Stephen's faith, obedience, and ultimately his death? We see that there's this young man who witnesses and approves the killing of Stephen. But this man here, Saul, who approves of this, later becomes Paul. The apostle Paul who writes three quarters of the New Testament, arguably like the greatest advocate that the early church had ever seen. But that's what Stephen's faith and martyrdom resulted in. It also, if you turn to the next chapter, we also see that believers are scattered all over the region out of fear because they're scared that they too would be stoned. But nonetheless, God uses suffering in this moment to spread the gospel. And the gospel just moves into other places, homes, conversations, people's lives. And so Saul here, the future apostle Paul, he writes this to the Christians in Rome. He says this, Romans chapter five, three to five. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance 
and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Remember that thought we shelved like 12 minutes ago? Um, that glow, that glow representing God's presence, his power, his favor. When we accept, profess Jesus as our savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit takes residence in our heart and in our being, which means we have the same glow that Moses had on Mount Sinai, that Jesus had in the transfiguration, that Stephen had in the midst of his trial and persecution. We have that same glow. We just recently came out of prayer and fasting as a church. And um, I've never fasted so much, uh, to be honest. And it's, it's really awakened a lot of new thoughts and, and, and convictions. But um, there was a particular week a few weeks ago. I, I forget which petition week it was. Um, but there was just a lot going on for me personally. And I felt very weary. Uh, I've shared with a few people. Like, it was like, I was like driving and all of a sudden I felt like my chest just like closing in and just a tightness of breath and these things. And as I'm driving, I'm like, Lord, like, like I need you to hold my heart. I need you to just feel like just breath in my lungs right now because church, church playing is not easy. Um, and I felt prompted to also fast coffee that week. And for those that know me, I like, I like breathe coffee, dude. And um, that thought entered in my head as I was driving on the highway. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. Like, I love coffee. But I think that thought came into my mind because I was truly I'm dependent on coffee. I haven't been off coffee for, like, years, man. I, at least one coffee a day because then migraine and all the withdrawals, all the things. But I felt so desperate for God to just do something in my life and all of the things I was kind of holding and all this, this weight. And um, by the time I got home, uh, I was like, I'm going to do this. And, um, man, that was a really hard week, man. Especially that Wednesday, dude, fasting food and having been coffee deprived for like two days at that point, dude, I was just going insane. But I say all this to say that hard, that week was very hard in that regard. But it's been a while since I've experienced so much breakthrough simultaneously. And it resulted in actually very, it's just very funny, like people outside of our community that just like had specific words or encourage, encur, like encouragement for me. I, that particular week, I was speaking at a grad retreat, which... It was funny how God used some of the things that I had committed. I committed to this like last year. And that week, there was just like so much week. So I was kind of like dreading going to this thing because I was like, oh my gosh, I got so many things. This is out in Maple Ridge. Shout out Jihan coming from Maple Ridge, bro. Um, I had to go to Maple Ridge like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. On Tuesday, I was Maple Ridge. So I had to go to UBC for class. And so I was like, Lord, feeling like Job out here. Um, but it was, it was crazy because my old teacher who she, when she, um, she's actually not that old. It's funny, like, when you get older, it's like, oh, you're only like, like six years older than me or eight years older than me. Like they got a teaching job like right away. And so I, you know, my old teacher's like overseeing it and she's asked me to come. This is my third year doing this. And I was like talking in the last session to these students and the students were great, honestly. It's my favorite grad class so far. I told them that. And um, I'm preaching this last session and I just see like my teacher kind of stand, my old teacher stand up and walk out. And I didn't really think anything of it. And then we know we finished at chapel time and whatever. And I talked to the other teacher who I didn't know. I was like, hey, you know, but we're just talking. And I was trying to wait around for like my actual teacher to come back, but she didn't. So I'm like, okay, actually, I have to, I have to get going. Um, and then I go up and we're out in Maple Ridge and I get in my car and I turn it and then I like back out like this. And then I see her in my rear view mirror. And so I was like, oh, like, and so I like put it in park. I hop out. I was like, oh, I'm glad that I could catch you. Um, and then she's just like crying. And I was like, oh, I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, are you okay? Uh, but she just said, like, yeah, just God was speaking to me in that moment, all these things. And then she just, like, she's like, I want to, I'm glad that I caught you. I was, you know, I, I, and she prayed for me. And it was just, like, exactly every word I needed to hear. And I just felt like in that moment, like, God was just, like, pr like, again, when we pray for each other, we're praying in the spirit. So obviously God's praying for us. But she just started crying. And I just felt like God just, like, I see what you're doing. 
I see, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna hold your heart. And that week, I was telling Anthony, even this week, I've started to include that in my prayer, like hold my heart, God, because I can't do this. And then even that later that week, my first workout with Catelyn, we just started this new rhythm of working out once a week. And I was so encouraged, not from our, well, yeah, from our workout was great. But then we actually hung out afterward and he was just speaking encourage, encouragement into me. And um, then the following Sunday, uh, I broke fast at Modus. Shout out to the homies at Modus. And, you know, I had my coffee and it was like, I was like really looking forward to it. And um, I had the coffee and then I, then I get it, like, Pretty shortly after, like my phone vibrates and I check my phone and I got this text message via like, you know, interact e-transfer. I kind of look at who sent it to me. I'm like, oh, that's probably a mistake. And then, you know, obviously I had to get ready for a service. So I text this person on Monday morning. I was like, hey, I think you sent me an e-transfer by accident. And they're like, no, like God told me that morning I need to send that to you. And I was like, immediately in my moment, I'm like, God sees me in my toiling and suffering. It wasn't like a, like a lot of money, but it actually covered a, a, an expense that week that I didn't expect, like almost perfectly. Um, and I was like, man, Lord, it's so funny that I just, in these moments where I, I mistrust you, but I'm like, man, I, I live and exist in the palm of your hand. And so no matter what trials and adversity and resistance that we experience, like God is with us. We have that glow when we follow Jesus as sons and daughters of the living God. He has taken residence in our hearts. And as we go into Holy Week um, and, and, and Good Friday and, and Resurrection Sunday, I would encourage us to be mindful that God is with us and that he has a plan for people in Metro Vancouver. The cost of living and people being driven away like, the powers and authorities of this world tremble at the name of Jesus. And we need to be reminded that he's not just our savior, he's our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks that you are a God who is close and you are a God who is near. You are a God who has given his life for us to be with us, restore us and redeem us. And so Holy Spirit, I pray that you would pull back the very thin veil that separates your heavenly realities from our earthly realities. May we begin to see what you are up to in our lives. In the confusion and persecution of this season, maybe for some of us, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal yourself, Lord. I pray that you would restore trust where there is no trust. I pray that you would restore faith where faith is depleted. Remind us, Lord, that even in our suffering, Lord, you move in the most surprising ways. Amen.